So the 19th chapter, 21 verses here, and uh, it's got an interesting theme. You'll pick it up real quick here. But after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. Because he was judged, he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as a sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints." Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written on that that no one knew except him. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. And he has on his robe and on his thigh the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and and of those who sit on them and the flesh of of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw a beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with him was the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeds from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So, as you can see, the overall theme of this, uh, if you think about it, they're only uh, based on chapter 19, only two places that humanity can make reservations, dining reservations, that is. Uh, according to the 19th chapter, you will either be uh, banqueting at our Lord's table, dining with the lamb, at the supper, the marriage supper of the lamb, or you will be bird food. And the interesting thing and the reality of that is, is the invitation to all of humanity is to dine with the lamb. Uh, he's not willing any should perish. And so th- this chapter really deals with that aspect of he's, you know, everybody should want to dine with him. I mean, you think about what an amazing scene. It's so amazing here that we're told by John that when he is, sees this scene in the 19th chapter, that he, f- he falls at the feet of the messenger to worship him. It's such an amazing thing. There's only a couple times in Revelation you see John have such a response. 
One, of course, was in the 17th and 18th chapters. We look at John when he saw that the, the, the great harlot uh, riding the beast, and, and that caused him amazement at what he saw. And then here, here's the opposite reaction. It's so amazing, he couldn't even imagine it. And so uh, John gives us that picture of it. Now, the interesting thing, people, when you think about making a reservation for a restaurant, a fine restaurant, why wouldn't anybody want this restaurant? When you find out the other one, you're the food, you're the, you're the meal. <laughs> why wouldn't you want to be at this restaurant? When Jesus took up the same idea in, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 14, he said, many were called, but few were chosen. In that same story that Jesus tells in Matthew 22, he explains why some were not allowed into the wedding feast as they did not have on the wedding garment. They were clothed in their own righteousness instead of his righteousness. And so what you have going on in our society, in our world today, and, and this is no way that I can tell, but God knows. He's invited all of humanity to come dine with him. But they must put on his righteousness, not their own, or they will not be allowed into the wedding feast. And, and, and again, it, it, it's not about going to church. It's not, well, I, I've got the wedding garment on, I go to church. No, no, no. There'll be a lot of people, unfortunately, that go to churches that won't be at the wedding feast of the Lamb. And again, it's something we've been looking at when we're studying First John. It's something we need to examine in our heart. Am I... Uh, is my righteousness, is it based upon what I'm doing for God or is what he's done for me? What am I banking on? What is, it, what is my righteousness in? What have I trusted in? And so John uh, uh, writes and sees this here. They came in their own good works. They won't get in. And Paul had mentioned the same thing. And here's Paul, the apostle, of course, was a Pharisee among the Pharisees. He was concerning the, uh, everything in the Jewish range uh, of, of being, his good works were uh, impeccable. But in Philippians, in his letter in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, he, he wanted, he, he, he made this statement looking back at what he was formerly to what he is now. He says, but being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. He discarded all of the things he was doing for God and boasted only in what God had done for him. I mean, you, I suppose that it would be much more difficult to do that if you've done a lot, you think, for God. And so Paul would mention in Philippians all the things he had done for God. And he said he counted them as dung, as rubbish, that they were worthless. Uh, so, uh, what a great chapter for us to examine, uh, you know, just for our own hearts. Notice he starts after this, he says, after these things, which indicates the timing of what John sees and hears here is after the destruction both of the religious and commercial systems, and uh, they're destroyed. And it's this destruction here that brings forth the praise to God in heaven as its first time the uh, uh, first of four times, rather, that it, in six verses that the word Alleluia is mentioned here, which, by the way, is the first appearance of this word in the New Testament. You only see it here uh, mentioned. Alleluia is mentioned for the first time, uh, and it doesn't happen to the last book of the Bible or the last book of the New Testament. The word in Hebrew is a word that means praise only to Jehovah, and in, based upon this passage of Scripture that we're looking at, there are four things that the multitude in heaven praise uh, uh, God exclusively for. Because it says uh, to the Lord our God, verse 1, salvation, glory, and honor, and power belong to the Lord our God. First, salvation. Salvation is an exclusive property of God. Nothing and no one can save us apart from Jesus Christ. He is the only deliverer of mankind. Humanity loves to put their trust in their intellect, their works, their prosperity, their power, 
with regards to salvation. Uh, some, uh, as Jeremiah would say, uh, like to put it in their idols. Jeremiah said, where are your gods that you have made for yourselves? Let them arise if they can save you in the time of your trouble. It is a sad state when somebody has trusted in anything other than Jesus Christ at the end of their life. You know, be it their, their wealth. I don't know where Bill Gates is spiritually. I, I don't know him. I don't think in a good place. But at the end of Bill Gates' life, his wealth cannot save him. I don't know where Joe Biden is. I don't know him personally, but if he doesn't know the Lord, it is, his power isn't going to save him. Putin's power isn't going to save him. All the works of the great scientists and the intellects and the university professors, the great authors, actors, athletes, None of those things and talents that they have at the end can save them or deliver them. They will die. None of those things are those who have given their life to give things away. All the great uh, people who have, have, have taken their wealth and their power and given things away, if that's what they're trusting because they've done good things, you could never do enough good things. Salvation belongs to Jesus Christ alone. And then he says, glory. Again, mankind seems to want to glory in all the things that they possess or accomplish. We're going to have, a, I think, a sporting event on Sunday. I, I've heard there's a sporting event. I, I don't know. Um, is it NASCAR? I, okay. That's for you, Dale. It's NASCAR. But... Uh, um, I hear they're going to have a sporting event, and there'll be people that will be glorying in their abilities. They'll even give away a trophy for, for some guy that'll say, I'm going to Disney World or something, but uh, that wants to glory in his accomplishments. But again, there's only one glory th that we can do, and that's his accomplishments, not ours. Uh, in heaven, uh, only what God... Uh, possesses and is accomplished will be appraised. You know, we, we, sometimes we joke about that, don't we, in heaven? I can't wait to get to heaven and meet Moses, to meet you know, these guys. So people joke about that, man. I just want to, I can't wait to see Paul. Thank you, man, so much. And you won't be doing any of that in heaven. We won't be praising the instrument. I mean, James is, about every week, James has got a new guitar up here, but every time I go up there, I look at the guitar, and, and afterwards, James plays, I don't go over there and just ignore him I, and go, that guitar, thank you for playing so well, you know. And why would we do that in, in heaven? You know, I, it would be good for the servants of God to remember that, I think. So many, uh, just like in every other profession, desire to have, they're ambitious, desire to be recognized and popular and have their names printed and, and, and get to speak and write books. And I think it would be good for all of us that are servants of Christ to, to try as much as we can to be invisible. And as much as it's possible to, to, to deny our ambition, if you will, and, and our popularity and to be in a place uh, in our invisibility, uh, where nobody even remembers our name, but remember his. That's a great place to be at. And, and in heaven, that's, um, I, I think it's going to be the opposite. I think the ones in heaven that, that uh, will be, I don't know, closer to the throne or, or, or given us, are those that you never knew did anything. And everybody thought it was, always recognized it was the Lord. I, I think there's a special place for people that, that minister in obscurity. I mean, right now in this global place we're in, and for th thousands of years since the ascension of Christ, there has been men and women serving that nobody knows their name. Nobody recognized what they did. Nobody, no books are written about them. We don't know their events. We don't know what happened. We don't know... Uh, their laborers of love and their servants hard. We know nothing of them. Isn't that great? But because of the works of their sacrifice, because they did it for the glory of God, 
the kingdom was advanced. People became believers. They grew more in love with Jesus. Now, we want to remember the names of the famous people who were used that way. And there's great people there, and I'm not, I don't know them, but I think it's a wonderful place to be that only glory comes to that. James wrote something similar in chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. It's his anyway. Who are we to try to have glory? Why would we want it? Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, those of you would be the greatest of all and be the least of all. You want to be great? Learn to be least. Then he says, honor. And this is a word for honor that in, a word, in, in the word it means to be value. And, and in heaven it will be seen only God's work will have any value. All the things that we've accomplished on this earth for our benefit, for our glory, for our recognition is all going to burn up. The only thing that's going to last is ones that was for his glory, for his work. And I'm personally looking forward to that. It's going to be interesting to know and to see the things that brought him glory that I didn't think did or wasn't of value. We'll look at We'll look at and see what in heaven in such a clear way that we, we only by faith know now what was valuable to him, how he sees value. And then power. Finally, we'll, we'll praise him for his ability to accomplish everything in our own lives. Everything that's ever of any worth, any growth, any maturity, any value. Paul said if there's anything noteworthy, any praiseworthy, Put it into practice. Why do you, because you know what? It's not me. It has to be him. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Look for the things that are, that are valuable and have good qualities and traits because those are the things that are of the Lord. They're not of me. It's not that he just has a wonderful personality trait. No, he doesn't. He's a wretch. It's the Lord that does all the work. He's the only one that can get the glory for it. And, and it's, it's his power. It's, it's his work. It's not based upon anything. I also think it's interesting, too, to see the things that he's accomplished um, through ruin. I think the greatest growth times in our life is when we're at our, our least, not when we're at our best. I think that when we look at our lives and, and we're, you know, when we're finally broken, Finally down. I mean, we do everything in our own strength to try to avoid to be broken and down. How are you doing? Hang in there. Pull yourself up, man, you know. No, don't. Fall flat on your face. Be broken. Come to the end of yourself. That's when he can do his greatest work. I, it's unfortunate with me. It just seems to take years to get there. And major events. So power. And then look at verse 2. For true and righteous are your judges, because he has judged the great harlot and corrupt the, who corrupted rather the earth with a fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of the servants shed by her. There's no rejoicing here, just mere, the mere destruction of religion, apart from praising God upon his attributes. There's no glory in, we defeated the foe, some team is going to lose on Sunday. And you can walk around praising the fact and mocking the, the loser, I suppose. But there's, there's no, none of that going on here without, apart from praising God for his attributes. We shall all sing the praise of his judgments because they are true and righteous. God's judgments are not based upon speculation, but rather on what is true. He alone is all-knowing and everywhere present. God will never have to say, Dale, come here for a second. You know, that situation way back here, I missed that one. Sorry. He's not, he's not the umpire of the game on Sunday that missed the call that cost the game. There will be never a single thing in all of his judgments and all of his works in our life that he'll, that he'll have to come to any of us at any time. So think about your life now and all the events of your life 
and all the tragedies and the difficulties and realize right now, you can only receive this by faith, but right now realize if you're in one of those moments, he's not going to have to come to you and apologize for it. It had a purpose. It had a plan. I don't know what it is. That's beyond my pay grade. But in heaven, all of his judgments, all of his works, everything is going to be perfect. And we'll get to see it. Now, I don't know about you, but there's always that one thing. Have you ever tore something apart and ended up with, I know Ernie has, but you ended up with one or two different parts and you didn't know where they went and you didn't think they were important? You'll find out that these were important. You don't know what those parts were and why you had to go through it, but they were important. They were, might have been key. So I, I think I'm really good about tearing things apart. I just now have learned that I don't want to put them back together because I'm going to have a few pieces left over. I don't know where they went anyway. So it's just rather just either don't tear it apart or just realize it's now, oh, now it's just artwork. It's just somewhere laid. I have a barbecue like that right now. It's just kind of in pieces. Then, then he said, they're all righteous. Here what the word means, equitable. In other words, the punishment will always fit the crime. He will never give out too much or too little. We ought to always realize the fact that God knows the beginning from the end. And, and he's always going to be just and righteous, true and righteous. And God dealt with the religious system that killed those who proclaimed the truth, and he will do so according to truth, given outside and given and given what that which is equitable. It will never be you never say, well, that was a little heavy handed, God. That was a little heavy handed. That kind of you know, and we see things like that in our life from our sense of what is equitable and and sometimes we 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 see people suffer, go through things, and we think, well that was that, that, that was a little heavy handed, but we don't know the situation. In heaven we'll see that everything was perfectly equitable. It was right on the money. And then in verses 3 to 4, it says, and, and, they said, uh, and again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And so the smoke of God's judgment upon the religious scene seems to rise forever as an eternal monument of God's judgment of self-righteousness. And those of us in heaven will proclaim, so be it, praise the Lord, man. Forever in, in heaven it appears, think of this, that man's, I did it my way, which probably will be the song playing as this happens, I did it my way, my own self-righteousness, my own works, will be an eternal flame of, of ascending smoke to see it. In other words, all of man's righteousness is going to go up in smoke. All of their claims of, of self-righteous, I'm a good person. Everybody's good person is going to go up in flames. And it's going to stay that way for all eternity. You'll see, a, you'll have a burn pile. You look out over there, what's that? That's man's self-righteousness going up in smoke. What a great testimony of the foolishness of humanity. Verses 5 and 6 says, Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God. All you, his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of many thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God Almighty, our omnipotent, rather, reigns. And here, the praise is literally, keep, uh, literally reads, keep praying our God, as God who has been reigning in heaven is now reigning on the earth, and everything's under his feet. Finally, what an amazing, we're heading to the time where he will always reign. And what is in heaven will be on earth. Isn't that part of the prayer? Your will be done on heaven as it is, uh, in heaven as it, uh, on earth as it is, never had it backwards. Uh, it's late. So uh, isn't it, that'll happen. It'll finally be there. It'll be perfect. And then 7 through 8, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was arranged, granted to be arranged in fine linen, clean and bright, 
for the, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And this is an interesting passage, and it kind of, uh, and, and you'll note in the notes, I've got it kind of spelled out for you. It doesn't make sense to our traditions. Because if you take the timeline of Revelation and the rapture of the church being at the beginning, or even if you had it midpoint, usually they're in heaven, shouldn't they get married? So this is interesting here that this is really a picturesque of the, of the Jewish wedding, not of an American wedding or a modern wedding. Because at most weddings, it is the bride that receives most of the attention, but here it is the groom that receives most of the attention. And the bride is here not because of the list of the things that she has accomplished, but rather because she has embraced the groom's love for her. And again, interesting, the timing of this verse, because the marriage of the Lamb is in light of the rapture of the bride, and that is that we're now at the seven-year period of time. Why did he have to wait seven years? Well, he didn't really wait seven years because it's, this statement is based upon a Jewish wedding of that time frame and not an American wedding. A Jewish wedding actually had several parts to it. The first was betrothal. They were actually married a year earlier, usually about a year, at the betrothal. And it was a written legal document that the groom would arrange and, and write, and the bride would, would sign on it. Usually he brought a gift uh, as a seal of his pledge to tell her that he was coming back paying the bride price. And during that year, she was to be ready at any moment, making her wedding dress out of material the groom had provided for her. The groom was, was at his father's house preparing a place where they would be also together. And even the groom, of course, didn't know the time frame or the hour of the wedding. And he would often respond and when asked, only my father knows the day or the hour. All those phrases that you see in the Gospels uh, are all part of a Jewish wedding. Then, of course, there was the wedding day, the second part of this. We probably would call this, if you will, the rapture, if you would, or, or uh, the betrothal, the rapture, and the, and the wedding day. It depends on how you want to look at the time frame of this. But as the days pass, usually sometime in autumn, around harvest time, the bride would notice that the house that he was adding on to was nearing completion. And so she would start wearing, either start wearing her wedding dress or uh, would be wearing it often, telling her friends to get ready as the groom was coming at any moment. And sure enough, at the specific time, the groom would set off with his friends throughout the city wearing a crown and scented garments. And she would leave her ho home to join the celebration, and they wound around the streets until they arrived at the canopy. And the ceremony consisted of reading the original agreement that was a year old, and their friends and family given benedictions, exalting the crime and the brew. And there was no vows. None of that was done. Finally, they were led into the wedding chamber where the marriage would be consummated. And then there was the wedding feast, which was a week long, seven days, where for the only time in their lives they would be waited upon as if they were king and queen. And the final day, the seventh day, would be the great feast called the Marriage Supper. There it is, seven days, seven years. It's at the very end. So this fits perfectly on, uh, of the waiting for that moment of the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. So the rapture of the church, whatever the case you might want to be, it still fits that scenario. The church has been celebrating for seven years and now is having the great feast as they start their life forever with the groom. The bride is wearing the clothes of the, groom's, of the groom's righteousness, having put on his royal robe of righteousness, which is gifted to us through the grace that we have uh, uh, in his works on our behalf. Nothing of any effort ourselves. Then verses 9 through 10, it says, Then he said to me, Right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I, t I fell at his feet, it says. I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and, the, and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. And 
So the angel proclaims this blessing, and John, John's just so overwhelmed uh, that he's seeing, that, especially in light of what he saw in chapter 17 and 18, he's so overwhelmed at how God is now bringing the bride to, with the groom and to ever be with his beloved Lord and Savior Jesus. It's in a moment where he's overwhelmed. He's being united with the groom, and you can imagine the moment He's so overwhelmed that he falls at the feet of the messenger. Interesting that he's told not to do so. He says that he's just a fellow servant and to worship God. And then he tells them that the prophecy is, is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. What this reminds us is I think that we're very prone to worship messengers instead of whom they proclaim. The beauty of grace of our Lord is a spirit of prophecy. Don't worship any instrument. Worship the Lord. And here, even John falls victim to this, just probably out of sheer emotional. But we need to be careful of that in our lives. There's not any human being. You know, I've, I've grown up as a Calvary Chapel. I got saved in a Calvary Chapel, you know, Calvary Chapel pastor for 34 years or something like that. I don't know. 40 years I've been in, since I've been a Christian, always in the Calvary Chapel. And, you know, I, I, Chuck Smith was a good servant, man. But he wasn't a perfect servant. And he was never worthy of worship. And yet I would hear at conferences, Pastor Chuck says, Pastor Chuck says. Well, that might be the problem. It's Jesus says, Jesus says. It's not what anybody person says. We're we, we were probably too sophisticated than falling at the feet of some man, hopefully. But we sure do it in actions and words sometimes. Nobody's worthy but Jesus Christ. And then in verses 11 through 16, we see another scene unfold. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes wars, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that... With it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. It's the second time John is, sees an open door into heaven. Chapter 4, verse 1 was the first time. And, and, and John sees into heaven, and behold, the Father and the Son of the throne as he's caught up. Here John is... Is, see, is caught up to see Jesus ready to come down. And it reminds me of the prophet Isaiah who, who wrote this in Isaiah 64, 1, Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. And in chapter 6, verse 2, the rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. Here the rider is the true Christ. And at Jesus' first coming, he came riding a donkey, a sign of peace. Here he comes riding a white horse, a sign of war. And there are four names identified with the rider, of which we only know three. We'll wait to hear the fourth one when we're in heaven. The first one is found in verse 11. He who said on him is called faithful and true. The context of the name points to the, righteous, the righteousness he judges and makes war which speaks of how he administers justice as well. In fact, he can be nothing less in all of his dealings. In all of his dealings, he can be nothing less than righteous. He's perfect in all of his ways. There will be never a single thing that ever, in all of his interaction, both on heaven and earth, that nothing he ever did was wrong. It is impossible. And I know how many people blame him for taking their mother, their father, their child, their everything else. And so here we find that, that God is perfect in all of his ways. There's no, you know, the election. They overturned the election. I mean, I, all this stuff that you hear all the time. Crazy things. God is on the throne. 
His ways are perfect. And maybe he's not the guy we wanted, and maybe it was the guy you wanted. I don't know, but his ways are perfect. God cannot do what is wrong. He's faithful and true. He has never and will never do anything that is not true, and we can count on this in our life. And when you're in the places in your life where you're feeling like what you've gone through is unjust or, or you're going through a really bad, this is a great verse to remind yourself. He's faithful and true. And I don't understand how this is, is faithful and true and consistent with his character, but that's based on my ignorance, not his. He knows what he's doing. He's always going to be right. And far too many people are, are devoted to that which is false and believe the most important thing that they are devoted to is when it works out their way. I don't want things to work out my way. I don't know what is best for me. I know what is, uh, who is best for me. I don't know what is best for me. He is best for me. And just devotion to, to who he is, being obedient. Secondly, verse 12, he had a name written on it that no one knew except him. Well, I'm here to tell you I know the name. Now, if you hear that, that means I'm a false prophet, just to let you know. I don't know the name. But I'm sure there's some guy out there who wrote a commentary on this who now can tell you that he's figured out the name that no one else knows. But I'm not that guy. I don't know. He has a name written that no one knows except himself. Now, I'm sure there's a guy, again, that's written a book on this that can tell you what that name is. But we don't know because he says it. This name is that no one knows except himself, except for that has to do with his eyes like flame of fire and his head with many crowns. I don't know if this is a clue, but... His eyes have penetrating knowledge and his crown speak of complete authority, both of which relates to his omniscience and omnipotence. That's as good as it's going to get. And I can't help but wonder, in light of chapter 4, verse 10, that the many crowns might be the ones that he gave us that we've given him back. Because everything we've ever done that he would reward us for is because he did it through us. And the mystery of this name is one which we'll spend all of eternity discovering. It's, it's a, we'll get to find out what that is in heaven. And so much about the Lord, really, when we really think about it. I, that's why I think, you know, somebody's got their doctorate degree in theology. That's a laugh. How can you, how can you be a doctor in, in the unknowable, unknowable God, the, the, um, the all-powerful how, how? How can I be an expert? I, are you an expert in theology? No, I don't know anything as I ought. There's, there, how could we ever be, even in heaven? So much we don't know that we'll spend all of eternity finding out. When we, we get to be with the one who's loved us so, and we've experienced just a bit of that here on earth, because we, we have limited abilities. We dwell in this fallen flesh, but in heaven, we'll in a glorified body, think how much more you'll enjoy the love of God. How amazing it will to discover all the nuances of his character, his nature for all eternity. Heaven boring? No way. It'll be the most magnificent, amazing place ever. I don't know why anybody, you know, you see the movies, people want to come back from heaven. I have, you better not resuscitate me. That's all I say, you know. I'll come up swinging, I promise, man. I just let me go. I think, man, how, you're in the presence of the Lord for eternity? Man, how amazing. Verses 13 through 15, he was clothed with a robe dipped in the blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And his armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen with white and clean, flowed him, uh, followed him rather on white horses. And here we, we see the name is called the Word of God. His name is identified with the fact that he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, of all what he's done to, uh, and his sacrifice is part of that. And, of course, John's already mentioned that in the first chapter of uh, the Gospel of John. And so uh, here in the 21st chapter of Revelation, we'll also read that he's called the Alpha and the Omega, which is the first and last of the Greek alphabet. In other words, he's a final authority on the truth 
and what is right. Furthermore, the armies of heaven come to fight, to come with him, but not to fight. The armies of the world will be defeated by the word out of his mouth. Man, that can be great. I don't know what that. Man, just one word. That's it. Boom. Done. They have all these sayings about how there's good and evil, yin and yang. You know all this. How they're always equal. Not they're equal. There's. We're going to all marvel at Satan and go, this is the guy that shook the world? This is the dude? No way, man. You think how powerful the Lord is, he does it by the word of his mouth. And they're just watching the victory, which he won at Calvary, will be culminated here. And the weapons of his warfare are not carnal. They're powerful. And then judgment will be just with the word of God just to who he is. He'll just open his mouth, and that's the end of it. In verse 16, he has on his robes and his, his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And finally, we give him the fourth name, which reveals there is none above him. There's no appealing judge. The buck will stop with him, and aren't we glad it does? What can the, so what can the world do to us? That's what Paul said, thinking of these things. What, what can the world do to us? What can... What can anybody do to us? There's nothing they can do to us. Oh, they could make us wear a mask. That's it? Really? They could get you to have the jab. Really? That's what we're worried about? There's nothing. They could put us in prison and concentration camps like there's some other, up in upper part of Montana, and they're going to take us all and hold. I've heard all this stuff. Who cares? That's it? Uh, we don't rally up and fight and get our guns. I don't know what we're worried about. I don't see there's anything to fear here, man. I, I don't know why I, I, we would get rallied up for all those different things. He's the, he's the one. If you're serving him, we've got nothing to worry. What can the world do to me? Oh, they oh, they could kill you. Oh, that's a downer. Really? Send me home to Jesus? Go for it. They could, you know, there's nothing the world can do. There's really nothing they can do to us. Keep serving the Lord. He's the answer. And then 17 through 21, we finish off, and we realize that if you don't want to go to dinner with the lamb, you will be the dinner for the birds. And that's not the rock group. Uh, and in fact, you'll be declining the invitation you're accepting to be gathered together to the supper, and, and, and uh, you'll be just bird food, unfortunately. John sees the angel standing in the sun, and I, I don't know, literally standing in the sun, but if you take it out, that's 150 million degrees Fahrenheit, so I don't think you have any problem seeing the guy. Uh, and, and it's not a matter of social standing. Apparently, it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to be able to avoid this if they rejected Jesus Christ. All the armies of the world will converge on the plain of Jezreel Valley to fight against each other, but when they come to see Jesus, they'll turn their weapons on him. How the foolish heartedness of man. We're going to defeat God, who spoke us into existence. It's like the Tower of Babel. We're going to bypass the one that spoke us into existence. Shh, don't tell him. He's all-knowing, but he doesn't, you know. I think sometimes that people think God is Joe Biden. Forgets everything. I, I, they treat him like that. He, look, I know that'll make everybody mad, but anyway. There, I, people, look, he, he knows everything. We don't have anything to worry. The beast is captured along with the false prophet and cast in the lake of, of burning fire will to be, remain for a thousand years and then be joined by Satan, his demonic forces and fallen angels, those who refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And the rest are killed by the word of God and proceed from the, from the, uh, from the mouth of Jesus. So um, what, a, what an amazing chapter. The last few chapters of Revelation are just amazing things. And it's kind of we get to see all these crazy things. Isn't it good to know? I mean, don't you? I mean, it's kind of good to know the, the outcome. We know the outcome. So everybody that says that I'd like, to know the, who wins before I watch it. I, 
Kind of like that. Because then, you, you know, yes, I got through some bad parts here, and I don't like that part, but it's okay because I know who wins at the end. So God's, you know, he's created me that with that appetite of like to know the end. So, you know, I mean, that's a real game or something. Like, I don't really have a care of who wins the Super Bowl. I really don't. But if, if you have a really passionate one team, I probably would be all, you know, caught up in who's going to win, you know. But the bottom line is, is that if I just waited and found out if my team won, then it'd be worthy of watching it. Even if they were down by 40 points at halftime, I'd still, hey, it's all right. They're going to win them back and win. We've kind of seen in Revelation far that, that there's times where it looks like it isn't going to work out. But think about that in your own life, too. Have you not felt in times in your life it didn't look like it was going to work out? <laughs> isn't it good to know that you now read the end of the book and it's going to work out just fine? It's comforting. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for these people and those watching live on the Internet. Bless them, Lord. Be with Eric and others who are under the weather, touch and heal their bodies, Lord, and, and get them back to full strength. Bless Eric as he uh, delivers a message this Sunday and next week as well and, and the following Sunday. And, and uh, Lord, I just pray you be with this body and um, be with the work as we head out to Dominican Republic tomorrow and, and uh, prepare our hearts and the hearts of those that we'll have the privilege of sharing your truth with. And we thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.